see a huge potential for uh, electric vehicles as well as uh, automated vehicles and other technology that is coming forward. So I'm excited to be here and I'm excited to, to share at least a few ideas. I'm perhaps the odd man out in, in the sense that I don't really know much about electric vehicles. <laughs> So one of my goals of coming here was to learn more, and I've learned quite a bit, and I really appreciate that, and I'm looking forward to the utility stuff now as well. Um, so my topic today is why plan uh, for EVs, the role primarily, less so of the state, but more of the MPOs and other problem planning organizations that do regional transportation planning and help coordinate uh, local governments within the metropolitan areas as well as a local government agency, um, looking at a few case examples that we were able to, to identify uh, here in Florida around the country and then some steps on the media. So I kind of run through this uh, initial part very quickly. Um, I put this in more for my own edification probably than yours, but um, certainly I need to understand what are we talking about here in terms of technology and and um, this idea of PEV plug-in electric vehicles, and some run only on batteries, some are hybrid, some have extended range, and others don't, um, and there's different levels of charging stations. This is new to me, and it's new, I think, to most practitioners uh, that haven't been exposed to this idea. We have never had electric vehicles. Um, so now we have some new acronyms, which we love, and transportation planning. Um, and also, I looked out on the Department of Energy website and saw some great information, and I appreciate learning more about what's accessible through the uh, Department of Energy. Um, and it helped me understand that the sales uh, have really grown quite a bit, from I think it was 300 and some, what was it? 345 in 2010. Um, and then 2011, we see just under um, 20,000, um, and then it's tripled, and then um, six times greater in 2014. So here we've got a growth in this, uh, the sales of these vehicles uh, that's been quite, quite uh, astounding and is continuing, I think, even though we heard that it's somewhat stagnated right now because the gas prices, I think, it's going to continue to be of interest. Uh, population um, and although Florida doesn't have the highest proportion of registered uh, electric vehicles it still is on the map uh, here and I know most of it's out on the west coast uh, I heard I think it was 50% of the uh, electric vehicle sales have been out there is that what I heard earlier from someone uh, in California um, so uh, but yeah we, are, we do have a, a fair number and uh, I can imagine that's going to continue to grow uh, and that uh, there are huge benefits uh, from, from the public perspective in terms of um, GHG emissions uh, we see here and um, it's about half in, in terms of the electric vehicles and, and the fuel costs are, are, are much lower for electric vehicles. Now understood that there's issues there in terms of of how the power is generated, and I did see a study right before I came, I think it's out of Minnesota, that um, the PEVs, uh, uh, air quality and GHG emissions benefits are really uh, greatest when the electricity uh, uh, that's being generated is being generated from natural gas and renewable energy sources, and could be even worse if it's generated solely from coal fire plants, but Here's the thing, I, you know, as a planner, I know that it's uh, probably easier to manage point source than non-point source emissions uh, of all these different vehicles. So that as the utilities continue to look at technology and become greener, um, this is really going to be a huge benefit, I think. Um, so why, why plan? Obviously to meet public demand, which appears to be there and I imagine will uh, continue um, to be robust uh, with all of these options that are coming out that we've heard about. Uh, we have a, a, a number of environmental goals and objectives in planning. Uh, we want to reduce GHG emissions for the, that cause climate change. Uh, we're trying to incentivize transit use and get vehicles off the road. Uh, and, and put people in buses, and I think electric buses are really cool. They're, they're, uh, it's something that you can brand and sell to the younger generation, and I think it's, it, there's a win-win there, certainly. 
um, and our sustainable transportation livability goals and, and communities across the country really when I talk to them about transportation planning and land use policy and all these issues they're looking to become more sustainable and now we're seeing uh, these sustainability elements of, of comprehensive plans and all kinds of activities, uh, food, uh, you know, growing food in urban areas and so forth. So there's a lot of interest in green uh, and anything that supports the environment. Uh, and certainly uh, I've heard that here as well. And also uh, in livability, um, freight. Uh, uh, I was just in Portland talking about we were looking at freight and livability issues and the noise associated with commercial vehicles and emissions and how electric vehicles are, uh, are electric vehicle technology is one way to reduce that. Uh, and so again, I think there's a lot of benefit in terms of our planning objectives. There's federal and state requirements, the Department of Energy's Clean Cities program, and so those sorts of initiatives that we can support and advance, uh, the Clean Air Act, uh, the Energy Policy Act, MAP 21, which is our transportation uh, legislation, uh, which has a performance goal of environmental sustainability. So it's built into the planning process, essentially, to support this idea. And even on the state level, uh, and I have a note here for, of a multi-state zero emission vehicle task force involving a number of different states on the West Coast and East Coast, who entered a memorandum of understanding uh, to encourage EV and support deployment of that infrastructure. Uh, and to um, really get uh, zero emission vehicles um, uh, initiated in their area uh, through different um, means and, and then these incentives that states offer. So there's a lot of reason uh, and a lot of uh, synergy there and safety actually was a new one that I heard about while I was here and safety certainly is a big planning objective uh, in transportation. Uh, what happens if we don't plan? And I just, this charge range image, I just heard, heard this on the national news too before I came and folks are just getting upset in areas where there is not enough supply to meet demand. Um, Silicon Valley is an example of that. Uh, and uh, now USF is not at this, at this stage, but in USF we have uh, two charging stations on the whole campus. Um, back, I think it was 2011 or so, and, and 27 electric vehicles on campus, and the, the, the students are like, oh, we can't charge the vehicle or the faculty for that matter. And so, um, so getting that, you know, getting, a, getting aware of those issues, and they brought it to the student senate and said, we need more charging. And so, um, you guys, right, came in and and put in, put in some charging facilities in, in the garage next door to us. And almost immediately, once they were in, and I parked there every morning, there they were, uh, there were the vehicles being plugged in and charged. So um, certainly there's a need for that, and we don't want folks fighting over it. Um, and then the lack of infrastructure, obviously we heard, can deter the industry. And we want that industry to grow because it is environmentally uh, friendly. Uh, and going in and fixing and retrofitting after the fact can be more costly. And I've seen, I have a statistic later in terms of the single family homes, uh, for example. But uh, getting that in, in advance is important. So, what do planners do and what's our role? And I, I kind of you know, thought about that a little bit. I mean, the MPOs, as I mentioned, their, their job. Uh, from the beginning has really been to coordinate all the local governments in the, in the metropolitan area on a long-range transportation plan. And they fund that plan. And so um, as part of that long-range planning, they're, they're establishing goals, objectives, and policies, uh, some of which uh, can and should relate to uh, electric vehicle technology, and, and uh, uh, as well as um, they can begin to look at uh, what the demand might be, where that demand might take place, and, and helping with these EV readiness plans uh, through these system-wide studies, but also um, programming money to do those sorts of studies and plans within the region, and that's an MPO role. Um, they're, they're, they can provide seed money for, for these sorts of infrastructure readiness studies, and grants, in-kind planning. Um, and also they have to start thinking about the funding issues we've all faced here in Florida and, 
and across the country. We have a huge shortfall of funding in relation to need. Um, of course, we can argue how we define need, but um, uh, we really need to figure out how we're going to pay for the transportation system that we want to accomplish. And, and, and it's essential to our economy, it's essential to our quality of life. Um, so how are we going to make up any reduced revenue? And I really like that the idea, um, was it uh, Dr. Benton? You know, the idea of the, the solar technology and, and the, the charging panels, that, so you could literally charge your vehicle as you're driving it, and then that money could go back into helping pay for the system and pay for maintenance. Uh, we did, Florida DOT is doing this future corridors initiative where they're envisioning future corridors into the future, 20 or more years, 50 years into the future, and saying, what do we want to be, you know, eventually? How might that look and what does the technology tell us what we could be? And uh, we got some students involved in that and kind of a, not a competition, but multidisciplinary teams to come up with ideas. And that's exactly what they came up with. I mean, our future generation wants to see that. They would love to see uh, much more sustainable energy and, and all, use of all of these tools, um, including automated vehicle technology, uh, to, to help with fuel efficiency, to help with greenhouse gas emissions and renewable energy sources. So it's really, I think, <coughs> there's a lot of growth that all of us could do, and also in, in terms of the resilience of the overall system, Technology transfer, MPOs are great at that. Um, they can fund that sort of thing. And here's an example, electric vehicle infrastructure, a guide for local governments in Washington State. That's what you're seeing up there. Um, Puget Sound Regional Council. So they came up with this toolbox of model codes, uh, ordinances, standards, and so forth that relate to zoning, parking, signage, battery recycling, and so forth. Um, and uh, they could also, MPOs, provide data or be a centralized source in helping uh, communities have access to that data, <coughs> setting up websites, outreach, all sorts of things. So there's a lot of uh, opportunities there. And, um, and also, uh, I want to mention uh, kind of a shout out to the North Florida TPO folks that are here and their partners. Is, is, is uh, Wanda here? Oh, there you are. And uh, Brian, you're the utility guy. But, uh, okay, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> so the North Florida TPO is the um, uh, Clean Cities program. Uh, their manager, right? You're managing that program, correct? And and so um, uh, they call they they develop this what they call the Charge Well program uh, as part of their regional alternative fuels master plan, they got funding from the CMAP program, am I getting this all right? The congestion mitigation and air quality program, and uh, essentially uh, to purchase EV charging stations and, and work with the utility company who's providing installation, uh, $300,000 grant to begin with, is that correct? And to install the stations in both public and private locations. So, so there's an example also of public-private partnerships uh, that the MPOs can facilitate, and then they do the public involvement and ongoing engagement of the community in terms of transportation, so they do a lot of outreach and can certainly incorporate these ideas there, uh, as well as um, ensure uniformity uh, across the system, you know, preventing that patchwork of different municipal ordinances that can really uh, uh, bog things up and, and also uh, look at and making sure there's good um, coverage of the infrastructure. Uh, local governments, I mentioned, do a comprehensive plan. Um, and, and I already uh, mentioned in Florida it's mandatory. Not every state, of course, a lot of states don't. Um, the regional agencies here in Florida do such a lot of this for the rural communities. So the regional planning agencies are another role uh, in terms of getting this information out. Um, but uh, certainly as part of the climate change element or conservation element as well as transportation element, uh, getting some uh, uh, good uh, policies in there, readiness for EV and uh, infrastructure within new development, redevelopment or overall. Uh, these plans are perfect for that. Of course, we talked about the zoning codes and permitting, um, streamlining permitting processes for EV. SE installation, another acronym I just gained uh, while I was here. 
and um, uh, kind of an example. And, and then the parking requirements talked a little bit about parking. Um, and in multimodal transportation planning, communities are looking at establishing um, maximum rather than minimum parking requirements because they recognize that using those ITE sources that we typically use, um, a lot of times uh, uh, businesses are, are being required to put in more parking than is necessary. Um, so uh, it also creates a less walkable urban environment when you have lots of service parking. So we're seeing some communities, uh, I think Coral Gables was one of them, you guys are here, I think you guys are one of them that went apart and some others around the, the country in certain locations, you know, kind of limiting the parking supply a little bit more. But, um, but also providing for electric vehicles, uh, electric vehicle parking um, incentives uh, or requirements of by 2%, say, of, of parking for PEVs. A minimum one space with exceptions. That was in the city of Miami Beach, and uh, and also that uh, minimum parking requirements be reduced when PEV parking is provided. I mean, it might not help you if you think you don't have enough parking already. But one thing we learned in Tampa with the Publix downtown was that people manage. You know, even when it's a lot less parking than out, a little bit out where I am, which has a little bit larger parking area because it shares actually with targets. So that's another interesting phenomenon, that shared use parking. But um, So there's some incentives built in, I think, with parking requirements that we can look at, uh, as well as uh, communities that can fund their own infrastructure and put in um, some signage and so forth. Uh, and that happened in Winter Park. Uh, uh, or uh, uh, establish uh, electric vehicle working groups or advisory committees. Now, MPOs can do this as well. They do it in freight now. Why not have electric vehicle advisory committee uh, as part of the MPO that can work on that topic and give you some good, good ideas and feedback. So just some ideas there and I'm stuck. So, um, am, I, am, am I, oh, did oh. I just crash it? Oh, okay, <laughs> here we go. I'll get it started again. Yeah. So, so yeah, there's a lot there in terms of uh, what, a, what a local governments and MPOs can do. And then, uh, let's see, let me go down a moment. Uh, that was where I stopped. And then we'll start here. And I'll just give you a, a couple of examples. Oh, uh, that was not where I was. And there I am. Just a couple of examples. I'm going to kind of run through them quickly here, but uh, I don't want to bore you, and you can read them uh, online if you're interested. But the, the comp plan, so Broward County. Uh, so they have a strategy to implement policy 19.2.5. Well, that's in their comprehensive plan. And those plans really are the legislative tool for the local agency. So they establish policies in those that they then abide by. And in that case, it was uh, to uh, support initiatives to diversify fuel options for the public transit and fleet vehicles. So they're working with the Department of Energy, Florida Gold Coast Green <coughs> Cities Coalition to support those initiatives uh, for charging electric and hybrid electric vehicles and broadly incentivizing alternative fuels. <coughs> Um, they've recommended uh, a variety of strategies to help them do that in the strategy uh, document uh, to modify zoning and land development regulations to define where the stations are permitted. What now here they're taking kind of a regulatory approach, and this may or may not be a best practice. I don't know. You tell me. But um, what charging levels are allowed? How the stations are sited? Um, and uh, who needs to uh, be required to pre-wire uh, for or install the stations? And then they, they, they're looking to codify site design criteria for that purpose. Streamline permitting and inspection. Uh, require new or redeveloping uh, multiple family units to plan for charging infrastructure. Uh, support Department of Energy's workplace charging challenge that we heard about. Uh, provide incentives for businesses to do so and expand the quantity of stations overall in major destinations. 
Um, they're also looking to incentivize parking for alternative school vehicles, um, both by requiring a certain percentage in multi-unit dwellings, uh, but also enforcing hours on PEV charging and uh, reducing parking requirements. So, so these same kind of themes are what we're hearing. Um, Indy Rezone is a big rezoning citywide. Uh, and uh, in that update, uh, they establish a requirement for two PEV charging stations for all developments with 500 plus off-street parking spaces. Um, and the electric vehicle charging stations, of course, count towards the total required parking. And they'll reduce it, reduce parking requirements when, when the charging stations are installed. So it's kind of a combo approach. Um, they uh, have an initiative to replace municipal fleet vehicles with EVs, the Freedom Fleet. And Blue Indy, this is kind of interesting, 100% electric car sharing service launched in 2015. So that was a partnership between uh, this French company called, is it Valor Group? You know those guys? City of Indianapolis and Indy Power and Light. Uh, Valor invested 35 million in this uh, electric car sharing service and the city provided access to on-street parking and six million to install the charging station. So they're pretty serious about it in Indianapolis. Um, and I think they have the largest, when do they say the largest metropolitan uh, uh, PE fleet in the nation? It's also something else I read earlier. Um, San Diego, of course, is a, 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 a huge market for PEVs. There were over 7,000 on the road in 2015. Over 500 publicly available, or 2014, over 500 publicly available charging stations. And so they have a regional EV infrastructure working group that works with SANDEP, which is the MPO for, for, for the San Diego regional area. And um, uh, so, so they've been advising them, and they created this plug in readiness plan. Uh, includes a lot of information for uh, the various stakeholders. Uh, and again, uh, they're recommending better regional planning for siting of infrastructure. So we need to understand the needs and how to establish these priority locations. So that's kind of interesting to hear from Ashley and others on how, how we do that. Um, also, the zoning codes again and permitting. Um, and uh, uh, working with uh, promoting uh, better communication with utility companies on the grid impacts of all of this incentivizing off-peak charging, and uh, consumer outreach and education. So um, again, a lot there. Uh, Portland, uh, electric vehicles, the Portland way. Um, I guess this was adopted by the city in 2010. And um, they're streamlining electrical permitting. Uh, apparently, Portlanders can get a permit instantly online and receive an inspection in 24 to 48 hours, which is pretty amazing. Uh, they allocate right-of-way space. Uh, they have a pallet program that allows private entities and utilities to place up to 50 charging stations in city right-of-way. Uh, they have adopted signage and parking enforcement standards with uh, consistent with state and regional practices with time limits to increase turnover. And um, creating a program to serve EVs and garage-free homes. Uh, and this is, so they're partnering with Zipcar to allow members to use Zipcar's fast charging technology if they, if they don't have a garage where they can uh, charge their, their uh, uh, car. And uh, they're also retrofitting uh, and marketing underutilized parking spaces throughout the city. And we have a lot of those in our cities, as I said, because we have excessive parking requirements overall generally in the U.S. Um, and they're promoting state and federal EV tax incentives, an educational campaign, and partnering with the freight community uh, to facilitate adoption of EVs. So they have a sustainable freight strategy, and again, as I mentioned, you know, anything to reduce noise and emissions is, is a happy thing uh, within the urban context. Uh, so that's uh, a goal that they have. Uh, and, and my last example, and I'm Probably not going to take 30 minutes. <laughs> My last example here, Palo Alto, uh, which I read um, has more electric cars per capita than anywhere in the U.S. Is this, is this jive with what you, what you know? 
Um, so in 2013, they passed an ordinance to, to require pre-wiring all new homes for PEV chargers. And according to the to uh, the document that we read, it adds uh, only $200 to the cost of a single-family detached home compared to $500 to $1,000 if you were to go in and retrofit that after the fact. So if you're in a market where there's a lot of uh, uh, demand and there's growing demand for electric vehicles, it makes sense to start to build in these sorts of requirements into the development process. And that's really what planners do. Um, and so whether you're in the transportation or land use planning process, you are going to, um, this is interrelated. And one of the things that we've realized in recent years is that all, the separation of the two is creating all kinds of externalities and problems uh, that are counter to our goals. Um, it's creating urban sprawl, it's um, reducing energy efficiency, it's increasing the cost of providing uh, for public uh, services and infrastructure. Uh, so I think, you know, from here, I mean, from my perspective, what needs to happen uh, is we need to make it easy for the practitioner uh, who doesn't have time to go and research and possibly attend some of maybe they don't get funding of it. Um, increasingly, people can't travel to many conferences anymore at the government level. And so, uh, similarly to what we do in multimodal transportation planning, we can do it with electric vehicles uh, and automated vehicles for that matter, but uh, more so electric vehicles, which are here now in the media, I think. Um, and that is uh, uh, start to document what's working and what doesn't. Taking from these great resources that are already out there on what Clean Energy's website, the Department of Energy, uh, what they've done, what, what Oregon has done, what California has done, and, and synthesize that information, kind of vet it, what's, what's working, what isn't, what we know about siting of these uh, uh, charging stations and uh, how can we facilitate public-private partnerships in this area um, and looking at all of that and then documenting it in a way that's easily accessible to the practitioner, that they can readily adapt into their plans, their codes, their permitting process, the building codes uh, at the state level as well, um, and training and getting that information out, pushing it out through um, both on-site trainings, webinars, and so forth, and communicating that so um, so we can raise up the state of the practice. And that's what we've done in multimodal planning, access management, you name it. Um, uh, and uh, they do appreciate it and use it when you provide that information uh, for them the they can use, as opposed to a research report. So, that's all I'm going to say. Uh, I appreciate your time. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Thanks, Christine. We could have, have a minute for a couple of questions. Yeah. Thank you, Christine. So I guess I have two questions. Uh, could you please elaborate that uh, what kind of standard methodology uh, do planners use to reach a certain conclusion? Since you mentioned use of data that's available from different parties. So is there like a standard practice for planners? No, there isn't. <laughs> okay. No, essentially, you know, the, the planning process involves a collection of information from a variety of sources. Now, um, on the transportation planning level, you have travel demand modeling that happens. Uh, you have to look at those models and make professional judgment to where you want to uh, make changes in the transportation system and then what mode you want to use. Um, I'll say on a network planning level now, what we're doing is something called context-sensitive solutions where we look out to the area and we then begin to prioritize the network for different modes. So for example, um, priority networks for freight would be your interstate highway system, your access areas into the port. Um, then you move down that level um, to, the, the, to the, the priority routes for transit, public transportation, walking, cycling, the commuter routes as well. And then what's the land use context in that area that you're addressing? Um, is it rural, suburban, urban, compact urban? 
and then translating that into alternative cross-section types that then could be used uh, to design the network. Okay, and then we're right away is limited um, than making some judgment calls on what modes get priority and what don't. That's what's happening now in terms of system-wide network planning. Um, so, so it's kind of a combination, and then the public involvement process as well, and the stakeholder involvement. Okay. So, it's, thank you. It's so both technical and non-technical. I guess I have a second question. Uh, so, how does uh, how do the planners? Or in other words, what's the channel the planners have to actually influence the decision makers in the legislature? What was the steps? Well, um, essentially, the role in, in government agencies, the role of the planner is to carry out policies that are, uh, you know, vetted and established and adopted by the local elected bodies. Uh, or in the regional case, the case of the metropolitan planning organization, there's a board that uh, of elected officials that uh, approves uh, policy really and, and adopts the plan. So the planner's role can, you know, historically has been one of objective analysts. Increasingly, I see our role as more of strategic and advocacy role uh, in a sense, not to the extent of, of biasing information, mm -hmm. but presenting information in a way uh, that's um, top professional work, forcefully presented and defended so that you can then essentially influence that process. Thank you. Okay, well, Christina, I think. Uh well, thank you for coming and speaking. And um, uh, like I said, I, um, you know, one of the things that, that I discovered in working with EV arena is that there, there are a lot of opportunities in terms of connecting. And um, I think we're seeing a great job of you know, laying those out for us and seeing you know, what their engagement can do 